She's good, okay. Uh, thank you all for attending the IEP session. Um, we expect some more people to straggle in. I tried to hurt them up the best I could, but they're engaged in some lively discussion. Um, our esteemed former board member, Bill Duck, uh, from the Eastern Shore. Uh, he's an educator, uh, a father of a son with nystagmus. Uh, all around good guy. Um, he has his bachelor's in journalism from the University of Maryland in 1990, reporter editor at the Daily Times in 1990 to 1993, teacher at Wicomico, like thank you, high school in Salisbury, master's degree in teaching and learning with technology, and a member of an IEP and 504 team 1994 to the present. And I imagine you've been on both sides of the IEP yes. discussions. That's okay. <laughs> uh, Bill also uh, has a very detailed uh, handout here, which you be grabbing it before or after. And because I have to leave my wife with the kids at daycare uh, and upstairs napping, I'm going to give uh, those uh, this gift up front. Well, so thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Let's enjoy the ice cream and juice. Okay. Um, it's actually going to be talking about more than just IEPs. We're going to be talking about three separate ways that your state governments are mandated in helping your kids with vision disabilities. IFSPs, which you may have never heard of before, or you may have, IEPs and 504 plans, what are they, what's the difference, and how do they help your kid, and what are you entitled to, and what are you not entitled to? So, um, I may need some help with the fancy this slide thing. Uh, I might need you to, actually. <laughs> I think I can get close to that. I think I can get close to that. Sorry, I'm used to teaching ninth graders, so I'm used to walking around going, put your gum away, put your phone away, give me that magazine. So I, I talk a lot. I throw people out. Um, so I talk with my hands a lot, and I wander a lot. So I apologize to anybody watching this on video ahead of time. First things first, does your child even need accommodations? That'll be the first thing we talk about. Next, at IFSP, where do you start? Those start from birth, and we'll talk about what services your kid's entitled to before they even get to school. Entering school, do you need a 504 plan or do you need an IEP? And how's that determined, and can it change? Then we'll talk about what 504 plans are, uh, what IEPs are, what happens if you're not happy, and what happens after they graduate high school. None of this is to be considered legal advice. I am not a lawyer, nor do I play one on television. So um, I've been on my school's 504 and IEP committee since I started teaching in 1994. I did it because it sounded like a cool thing to do, and I had no idea that a mere six years later, it was going to become rather relevant in my life when my son was born in the spring of 2000. He has albinism linked infantile nystagmus syndrome. He thankfully has a rather mild case. His visual acuity for reading is to 2025. 20, His neuro pediatric neuro ophthalmologist at Johns Hopkins has already assured us that he sees no problem with him being able to get a daytime license, and it'll probably be up to him about whether he can drive at night. Doesn't need any large materials, um, and doesn't have a whole lot of accommodations. We got lucky, not everybody does. But even if your child's visual um, acuity isn't as good, there are still a lot of things that state and federal government have mandated that has to happen for your child. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And John did a great job, this is gonna drive me nuts. John did a great job of going through my bio, so we can skip over that, since I have 54 slides to get through. Hey, we're already through three of them. Your child has nystagmus. What does that mean for his or her education? It may mean a lot. It may not mean much. It depends on the level of the disability, and depending on the type of nystagmus, the nystagmus may improve with age. If yours is albinism linked, like my son's, their vision gets better as they get older. In some cases with nystagmus, the Vision starts at some place and stays, and in some cases you have acquired nystagmus where you go from not having it to having it. So every case is individual. That's why I'm not going to get 
into too much detail into actual accommodations as far as this works for the segments or this doesn't because every case is unique. There are, as you heard from Dr. Hurdle this morning, there are dozens if not hundreds of reasons why people have nystagmus and sometimes it's simply idiopathic. We don't know why. So every case is going to be individual. So I'm going to do a little bit more of what services are available and what kind of things you should be looking for to be asking for for your child. You may want to start an IFSP soon after a diagnosis. My son was diagnosed at five months was in his first pair of glasses at nine months. His IFP, now IFSP started before his first birthday. Once he got into school, we went with a 504 plan. We did some educational testing and we brought his medical records from his doctor and we determined the 504 plan would best suit his needs rather than a traditional IEP. Your mileage may vary. So, first things first, before your kid even enters school, you may qualify for an individual family services plan until age three. That's federal. Federal government says you can do that until age three. They have tasked the states with delivering those programs, and each state delivers them in their own way. I can tell you from experience how Maryland delivers them. Maryland delivers them through the local Department of Health. And until age three, the local health department is in charge of delivering services for any kid who needs them, not just for vision. In this case, obviously, we're worried about vision impairment, but if there's any medical need that would require services, such as therapies, it gets delivered through an IFSP, through whatever agency or state agency has been tasked with delivering it. Like I said, I can speak for Maryland, it's the health department. It may be the Board of Education in your state. Your pediatrician is going to be the best person to ask on who delivers those services. Because I will guarantee you, your kid is not the first one he has seen that has an impairment of some sort. So this won't be the first time this question has been asked. And if he doesn't know, then I would start by calling your local board of health and they would probably be able to tell you. Um, like I said, in Maryland, schools handle IAPs, but each county health department handles IFSPs. Your state may differ. So, IFSPs, what does it do? It is an individual family services plan. I probably should have spelled that out somewhere on the slide. I don't think I did. IFSP stands for Individual Family Services Plan. In most cases, it's the mechanism states use to handle the delivery of services like therapy. And therapies can include occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, and various therapies to help your children use their vision as best they can. My son went through all four. His speech therapy lasted six weeks. That was it. They had milestones they wanted him to hit. Two sessions of speech therapy a week over six weeks. He hit the milestones, we were done with speech therapy. It was literally just had a couple of stumbling blocks he needed to get past, boom, done. You, in some cases it lasts through age three. But once that assessment is done, then if they need occupational therapy, which um, like I said, focuses on hand-eye motor skills, or physical therapy, which, handle, which handles things like gross motor skills, Anybody else have a son who didn't walk until he was almost a year and a half? I got one of those. <laughs> so, um, and again, we did a developmental we did a developmental delay check at Kennedy Krieger at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and he was solidly six months behind in everything. And they kept telling us, it's, he's going to catch up. It's just going to take a while to keep using the services. We did, then he did. So. Um, but don't be surprised if you get this laundry list of check marks that he's not, or that he or she is not meeting, and they suggest all these therapies. It's a way of getting them caught up. And in most cases, they're going to. So, as my sister-in-law, who's a doctor, kept reminding me when we kept worrying about this. You know, Bill, I don't think he's going to crawl down the aisle at his wedding. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, Bill, I did just a, a pointer. With these programs, having a stagmus will not qualify them for these services. That's true. There has to be a need. There has to be a need. It's need-based and it's not meeting milestones. Yes, it has to be a need. It can't be just my kid has a stagmus, his acuity is 2100. I mean, we tried that and it didn't work. Yeah. But our, our son was not walking on time. Yeah. Other delays, uh, hypotonia. So he qualified for some mm -hmm. limited. He had to qualify for PT, I believe. Yeah, there's going to be there's going to be an evaluation that has to be done. There has to be dem demonstrable medical need. And without, and you're going to find the same thing when you do the initial IAP 504 meeting. We're going to have, you're going to have, there's going to have to be an educational need for your child to qualify for services. 
Some therapies may be only the case for a couple of months. An IFSP should be reviewed about every six months and no longer than a year between reviews. And if you're under age three, it should be every six months. So between ages three and, f three and five, now what? That's when things get tricky because the IFSP has now expired at age three. The agency that was tasked with delivering those services until age three is no longer tasked with doing that. However, your school system is not going to be legally responsible for picking anything up until they're in an educational setting. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know too many four-year-olds that are in an educational setting. If they're in a federally approved or state approved preschool, you may have some rights on getting that IEP started a little early. But if they're into traditional daycare, there may be a donut hole as far as coverage for services. So again, you're going to have to demonstrate educational need in an educational setting. If you can do that, you can get services. If you can't, you're probably waiting until the first day of school for services to start being delivered. I wouldn't wait until the first day of school to start asking for them. So in that last transition meeting that's going to close that individual family services plan, which is going to be held right around the child's third birthday, put a transition plan in place. When my child goes to school, this is the plan of what we're going to do. And in most cases, it's going to be we're going to construct an IEP or a 504 plan. There is a pilot program under federal law that's trying to fill that age three to five in that transition meeting to see if there is an educational need to make sure that stays in place. It's getting tried out and we'll find out with federal funding how that goes, but there's still kind of a donut hole between ages three and five. So school begins, you get the letter saying, welcome your child to, you know, world's best preschool or world's best elementary school for kindergarten in the fall. When you get that letter, you need to get on the phone with the school and you need to say, my child has a visual impairment and we need to have an IEP meeting about how you're going to deliver services for my child. You're going to, at that meeting, we're going to, the team is going to decide if your child is best served by an individual education plan, a 504 plan, which refers to a specific section of federal civil rights law, or if there's not an educational need that he is not eligible or she is not eligible for special education services. It's two different ways to address student needs and it's actually two separate laws. Like I said, 504 is actually a specific section of federal civil rights law that deals with non-discrimination based on disability where the IEP plan is based on its own law for delivery of educational services. So, compare and contrast. I put this in for you guys to review at your own time, but basically what it comes down to is that middle section, what do they have in common? Both plans are gonna allow for accommodations and modifications to the school environment to help your kid learn at an average pace. So what, do we, what does it take to get your kid to be like every other kid in the classroom? What a normal education would be. 504 does it under civil rights law, and then the IEP does it under education law. And I'll let you review those details at your leisure. So when you get that letter that says, welcome to the world's best elementary school, we expect your child to be enrolled for kindergarten in the fall. You've made the call to the school. You, you need to show up to that meeting, if not send it ahead of time, the documentation of your child's medical disability. In this case, it's going to be nystagmus. What I would suggest is you have a letter from your doctor stating what types of issues he expects your child to have in class. Does your child have a problem with contrast? That's a classroom issue. Does your child have a, chance, have a problem with glare? That's a classroom issue. Because if my classroom's got big windows and no shades, or we still use overheads, that's going to be an issue for a kid with astagmus. Um, does your child have visual crowding? Do letters get scrunched together in the middle of words? Do they need enlarged type? Do they have a hard time recognizing faces? It may not sound like an educational problem until you realize they're going to be in a class of 26 other human beings. Then it becomes an educational issue. So, um, my child has a problem with, chasing, with tracing small moving objects. Doesn't sound like a big deal until you put him in a fourth grade PE class where they toss softballs at him. Then it's a problem. Or they throw a frisbee at him, because the last time he had a frisbee thrown at him, we almost had to go to the ER. Blood everywhere. So, um, <laughs> Cub Scout camp, we told him to tough it out. Um, thank God, no stitches. But, I mean, we've all been there. And so, 
whatever specific issues that your um, your ophthalmologist can put on that report, put. Because even if you don't think it's a classroom issue, a classroom teacher is going to be able to point at something and say, that's going to be a problem. So, and that's the kind of things that the school needs to address so that your child can have a chance at an education the same as every other kid. But please, the whole process cannot start unless there's a documented diagnosis from a doctor. It's got to be a doctor. Can't, we can't do anything as educators until you bring us something from a doctor that has a diagnosis on it. And again, the more documentation you can bring about what child's problems your child specifically has, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. Yes? Can you really tell if your child has those problems until they're in the classroom? Um, contrast, things like contrast, your ophthalmologist can pick up on. Things like glare, you can probably tell as a mom. Does he turn his head away really fast when taking him outside? Um, does he always want to wear a hat when he's outside? Things like that. Um, yeah, print size. I mean, you can probably tell that he can't read things that, you know, kids his age. Like if you've got normal starting reading books, you know, Jane chases the dog or whatever, and he's having problems reading those even though the point size is like 18 point, then you're going to know point size is probably a problem. But again, a lot of it is going to be that first assessment. Because that, that first IEP or 504 plan you write is not going to be in stone for the rest of his education. It's going to get reviewed yearly. If it needs to get reviewed more often than that, then you ask for another meeting. To, you, yeah. Parker, I was going to say, I mean, it, what might not be a problem initially because the print is 18 points, yeah. you could be later when they're in the mm -hmm. grade. So you could say the doctor, you could say how much point yep. you're going to be reviewing. Yeah, and you're going to be reviewing these on a yearly basis. And I know, and again, in my county, there's two vision teachers that service the entire county. We have about 23 schools, about 14,000 students. We have two vision teachers. Um, and so they do periodic assessments. My son doesn't get seen that often because quite frankly, he doesn't have that many visual problems. She drops in him on the beginning of the year, usually middle of September, sees how he's doing, and she's noticed things that we haven't before. Things like with, you know, he kind of has a problem with maps. Well, I should have known that because I'm a social studies teacher, but it never really occurred to me that he would have a problem. Because he reads fine. You know, he doesn't need anything large. Well, yeah, but maps have all these little tiny squiggly lines that are different colors. And you've got to be able to not just tell that that's a you know, road, that's a river. You know, so that the little blue squiggly line means something different than the black squiggly line. So in a lot of cases, it's going to be almost trial and error as you start the educational process. You'll find what problems he has, call a new meeting, and if an accommodation needs to be made, then you get it made. You can. That's actually a pretty easy switch, and your special education department will love you because it requires less man hours. And we'll get more of the difference about what the two plans are in a moment. An IEP is much more manpower heavy than a 504 is. 504 is, here's what I'm going to do to the environment to make it so you can learn. An IEP is, here's what I'm going to do for your child to make it so he can learn or she can learn. So it's my vision teacher said I had to take this sentence out, but I still think it's true. An IEP is if you need people to do stuff all the time. A 504 is if I can just change stuff in the room, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, legally, any lawyer would tell you, don't say that. That's not legally correct. But realistically, in the real world, as people sit in these meetings, if it requires him going some, to a different room one hour a week, five hours a week, that's an IEP. If I can enlarge his print and let him put sunscreen on before he goes out to recess, or put him in the front of the room or not use um, overheads, that's a 504 plan because I don't need people to do that. So legally, that's not the answer, but realistically, out in the real world where we really do this stuff, that's the answer. Yes? Speaking of the IEPs, um, if the teachers are recommending maybe that I might need to use like a magnifying glass, yes. you know, um, which she could do, but then I, that slows her down a little bit. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking just during her learning years, if, if she would prefer to have, I know we're talking about before about large print, mm -hmm. uh, are they, do they uh, have that right to say, well, no, well, we're going to give her as a magnifying glass? Or are they kind of, you know, would they have to give her at least large print for things that... Um, that's the kind of differences you can have in an IEP meeting. And we're, we'll go ahead and talk about what those meetings look like now, actually. You're going to be one member of the IEP team. You as a parent don't get to make all the decisions. It's, that's just, that's law, that's the way it is. There's going to be an IEP chairperson who's typically a vice principal at the school. They may actually be somebody from the Board of Education. Typically, it's a building administrator. 
there's going to be a general education teacher who may or may not have your child. It may come down to, okay, who had planning that period that we can grab out of the hallway? I mean, being brutally honest the way the world really works, let's grab a general ed teacher who's got planning that period, who can talk about what the curriculum looks like, you know, what a normal child should be expected to do. Hopefully it's a kid your, or teacher your kid has. It may not be, and legally it doesn't have to be. There's, probably, there's going to be a special education teacher who may or may not work with your child, but can speak about how services are delivered in that building and in that county. And typically a teacher of the visually impaired, if your county has one. Our county didn't have one until 10 years ago. One of our guidance secretaries had a son with um, a vision impairment whose name I forget, but um, the one when your vision gets slowly more like a pinhole, I can't remember, it's got two words, but anyway. And she fought tooth and nail and I think eventually filed suit and got the county to hire a, visually, a teacher for the visually impaired. That's the only reason we have one, because the parents sued. Um, so hopefully your, your jurisdiction has a teacher that's visually impaired. If they do, they should be sitting in on that meeting. More members may be on the committee if there are additional concerns. So remember, the answer just might be no. As John stated earlier, simply having nystagmus is not enough reason to guarantee your child IEP or 504 services. Realistically, if he, has, if he or she has nystagmus, there's probably going to be classroom issues. But we're going to have to document those first. We're going to have to sh there's going to have to be proof that there is an educational need based on your child's vision impairment. Because if your child has a visual acuity, reading acuity of 2025, and can read an overhead, and can read normal size print, chances are they probably aren't going to need services. But for an overwhelming number of children with nystagmus, at least in the beginning of their educational career, they're going to need services. So nystagmus by itself is not a qualification for visual impairment for an IEP. It just isn't. There's going to have to be educational need. You're going to have to come up, you're going to have to have a statement of visual impairment and a determination of the educational impact from your ophthalmologist. This child is going to have difficulty with print smaller than 12 point. Your child may have difficulty with low contrast objects. You know, and, that, and that would be enough to start an IEP or a 504. At that point, we've got to do something. We've got to change the way instruction is delivered to be able to accommodate your child. You're looking at at least a 504 plan. On the other hand, 504, as soon as you hand in that diagnosis of nystagmus, we can start a 504 plan because nystagmus is going to require some changes to a classroom. Just about everybody who has nystagmus is going to need to sit in front of the classroom. They may need a large type. They may need to sit away from a light source. But, you know, there's going to be, it's hard to find a case of nystagmus that wouldn't qualify for at least a 504, but it doesn't necessarily mean an IEP. So which one's appropriate? I'm going to throw a bunch of legal language at you, but I'm always going to come back to the sentence my vision teacher told me not to say. If it requires people, it's an IEP. If it doesn't require people, it's a 504. Don't take that to your meetings. That's not legal advice. That's just the way the real world works. Um, under federal law, got to do an assessment of child's visual status, got to do an educational um, assessment. The school system's going to do the educational assessment and pay for it. You're going to bring the medical documentation. So we get the results back from the vision and the educational assessment. You brought the paperwork that says your child has nystagmus. Here's the, the, here's the issues she or he, he or she has. Visual crowding, trouble with font you know, below a certain type, um, trouble with overheads, trouble with glare. You know, that's all medical stuff. You bring that. They do the educational assessments. Is, your you know, is that visual impairment leading to problems with learning how to read, do calculations, and being able to use any equipment that might help them learn? Once we figured that out, do we need accommodations or do we need special education intervention? If I can change things in the classroom to make it so your child can learn, we're looking at a 504 plan. If I can sit your kid in the front, hand them enlarged materials, let them use a magnifying glass, if I can have them write their own answers on those bubble tests, and then I go back, and then the teacher goes back and fills in the bubbles. If that's what we're looking at, we're looking at a 504 plan, because those don't require people to administer services. I don't need a special ed teacher to do any of that. If I need a special ed teacher to deliver a service, we're looking at an IEP plan. So, if it's gonna take special education intervention to help your child, you're looking at an individual education plan. Yes. 
Um, well, you're entering school in, in five. Yeah, I can tell you right now, as a teacher, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. I'm not touching another child's on block. Mm-mm, dude. Well, I know my daughter, the nurse, though, that, that I know yeah. in some schools, they don't have nurses. Uh, um, I can tell you, as a school personnel, I would be highly reluctant to be told that I had to do that for another child. I don't want to touch a kid. Sorry, nothing personal, but I don't want to touch a kid. Um, and. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I mean, mine's albinism too, so he's had to do some blocks since kindergarten, but we always just kind of had him do it. So, I mean, if you're looking at a. Well, I'm really, the reason I'm asking is because of my daughter's school, mm -hmm. and I know some states are different, but. Yeah, not every school has a dedicated nurse. Yeah, so it's considered a medication, so the kids are not allowed to have it in their backpack. Yeah. We had it in his 504 plan that he was allowed to keep it. And he, was a, that he had to have easy access to it. That's how we got around that. We got it right in the 504 plan. He had to have access to his sunscreen so that he could apply it before, his, before recess. And once we said that he was applying it, they were more than happy to let us keep it in the classroom. They were like, oh, no problem. So, Because <laughs> once he was putting it on, we'll keep, yeah, keep it right in his cubby. So, yeah, that's how you might be able to get around that. Saying, well, you know, he can put it on or she can put it on herself if you let her keep it in her cubby or her backpack. And I think you'll be surprised at just how willing they become when all of a sudden the school personnel doesn't have to touch your child. So <laughs> that's how we got around it anyway. Yes? Does different school districts have different agendas about pushing towards the 504 because they have a person? Um, I can tell you as a school administrator, anytime I can solve a, 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 special, admin, a special education problem with 504 plan, I'm going to do it because that doesn't require people. As a parent, if you think an IEP is the most appropriate, yeah, you're probably going to have to advocate for it. Because to be honest with you, 504 for a school is a much simpler answer. It doesn't require people. It's a checklist. It's I tell my teachers before the school starts, hey, this kid gets to put some block on before he goes up the recess. Sit him in the front. Here's your LCD projector because you can't use an overhead. And by the way, enlarge everything you give the kid. And then as an administrator, I'm done. I don't have to schedule anybody. I don't have to figure out where a speech teacher is or a vision teacher is. I don't have to figure out, you know, I, you know, it's just, it's a lot easier to do a 504 plan for a school. And to be honest with you, with a lot of kids with vision, a 504 plan really is enough. I mean, I, we sent our little tiny five-year-old, because God knows he was small, still is. And, you know, we were, you know, we were still amazed that he could breathe and walk at the same time. And they were like, he's going to be fine. And we were really like, I think maybe an IEP. And man, two weeks in, he was putting on his own sunblock. And he was saying, hey, I need to move to the front of the room. And I can't see this. And you would be amazed at how much the kids can really self-advocate. And you really, because my vision teacher, who has my, is in charge of vision services in my county, reminded me, your goal as a parent is to protect your child. But our goal as teachers is to get that kid as independent as possible before they graduate because you're not going to be there forever. At some point, they're going to move out of your house. So it's they, the goals are conflicting. You're the mom, and that's that you're a little boy or girl, and you know you know they can't always do everything for themselves. But from the teaching end, I want to get your kid as independent as we can, because we want them out being a productive taxpayer when they get done. So you know, I really got in trouble in my master's program when I said, what was your goal as a teacher? And I said to create well-rounded taxpayers. They got really mad. Our goal, well rounded taxpayers. So, what's an IEP? It's an individual education program. It is going to be much more goal centered and services centered. We want your child to be able to do this. Here's how we're going to get there. Here's the time frame that's going to happen. For example, it may say students are going to receive five hours per week of small group academic reinforcement with a special ed teacher, also known as coaching class. Um, it's going to happen over this time frame. This is what we're looking for at the end of it. Student will be able to. Score 80, you know, at the 80th percentile of reading comprehension for his grade level by the end of the academic year, or some analogous goal. But it's going to be goal centered. Here's how we're going to get to the goal. Here's the time frame we're going to meet the goal. And that's how it's going to be structured. All right. So let's talk about what you're entitled to under the free and appropriate public education. I think I spell that out later in the slideshow. I moved this slide, so I kind of lost the first reference. It's called FAPE. You'll hear that a lot in a special education law. Free and appropriate public education. Your child has the right to accommodations that will help him learn as any average student would. 
you're not going to like this sentence, but it's federal law. You are not entitled to services that will help your child achieve their best. That is not what you get. You get accommodations that will help your child access the curriculum as any other student. That's what you get. You do not have the right to the best your child can do. That sounds horrible, I know. But that's what we're looking at. That's federal law. You get what every other kid gets. You don't get a right to have the best education your child could possibly have. That's not what you get under federal under free and appropriate public education. You get average. So we're going to get your child to average. What they do after that is completely up to you. So 504 plan actually comes under a whole different law. It's under the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 that deals with individuals and disabilities and programs that receive federal funds. Basically, we can't discriminate against your kid in any program that receives federal money just because he has a physical impairment. So we're going to create an environment where he can access those programs as any other child could. That's what 504s do. Create an environment where your child can access the curriculum as any other child would. That's what it does. What do they have in common? Least restrictive environment. Basically, you want your child to be educated in as close to a regular classroom as possible with whatever accommodations and services that requires. They also have in common the fact they need to be updated yearly. Goals should be reviewed, transition plans for after high school should be in place, but an IEP stops at high school graduation. So if you're pushing for an IEP, remember, it stops the day they go grab that diploma from the superintendent and hold their hand up and you take that wonderful picture, your IEP is now done, gone, never to come back. <coughs> 504s can continue into college. It's a little more proactive on the part of the student. You've got to go ask for your stuff, and you have to do some legwork to make it happen, but you still have some rights under 504 laws in college. IEPs, you're done. Yes? I'll give you a piece of advice a school will never tell you. When your child is ready to graduate from high school, do not take the diploma if they're not ready to be truly done with high school. Once they accept the diploma, the IEP ends. Yes, that IEP should have a final transition meeting. If they do not take the diploma, they yeah. can stay under the IEP up to, I think, 21. Until the school year they would turn 21. So be careful. Yeah. Most schools will try to get you to take that diploma. I have a friend and a client who found out that just in time, a daughter has mild downs, and they were trying to get her to take the diploma, which would not have benefited her. Now, in our, in our county, we're pretty proactive with our state's Department of Occupational and Rehabilitative Services. It's called DOORS. And it's the transition program that helps young adults find jobs and, do, and does job training skills. And our county does a fairly good job of transitioning those kids into adulthood. Not every county does. And as John says, if you don't know that that IEP stops the moment they accept the diploma, then there are some services that your child may have been able to continue into young adulthood that they no longer qualify for. So that, that IEP stops at high school graduation. 504 can continue at least in a limited form in the post-secondary education. Yes? So if your child has an IEP in high school, before they graduate, can you switch it over to a 504? So that, it will that would have to be done while they are still enrolled in the high school. So, an IEP is usually used when people are needed to provide service on an ongoing basis. Things like, and this isn't an inclusive list, and then none of these by itself constitute need for an IEP. Things like dictation for tests, uh, additional time for reading and writing assignments, additional supported instructional time, the infamous coaching class. Placement in a classroom with a special education teacher, although I will tell you under least restrictive environment, it better not be a class with all IEP kids. Um, in fact, if the ratio is only 50-50, that's still too high. So if your child's being placed in a special education class with a second teacher, find out just how many IEP students are in that room. And if it's 14 out of 28, that's not least restrictive environment. Um, training and use of assistive technology, such as magnifiers, CCTVs, text readers, and things like that. All of those would come under IEPs. Here's someone who wants structure. You see the goal and the objective, and it has, usually has a time frame within it. This is an example of one from Colorado for uh, kindergarten to fourth grade. 
the standard, because they have certain educational standards they use and then the individual goals that fall under those. Students will read and understand a variety of material. The goal is the student will develop reading skills as supported by the following objectives. The student will skim and scan the grade level materials using the appropriate low vision device. The student will use appropriate low vision devices for sustained reading, basically train the child on how to use a magnifier correctly or a CCTV system correctly to the point where they can read great, great appropriate reading materials. Yes? You were speaking about nature restricted environment. Yeah. Um, if the school has uh, an intervention specialist, um, well actually we, were, we even asked him a couple times if he could sit in on her classes, because that, mm -hmm. that really is his assignment. And we asked him a couple times nice and that he would do like once a week and maybe then go once a month. Because I'm thinking that's, isn't that what they're required to do? I mean, we don't want to make trouble or anything. But well, it depends on what that um, interventional specialist has been tasked to do. If it's simply monitoring, then they're monitoring. If they're supposed to be delivering a service and the service isn't being delivered, then that's another issue. I guess he was, it was originally designed, like the beginning of the year, he was going into all of her classes. Okay. Like, so she's in a regular classroom. I can tell you one-on-one -on -one assistants, which it sounds like that was kind of designed to be, are going to be very hard to, are going to be very hard to procure because let's face it, they now have to dedicate one person yeah to one student and that is a substantial amount of resources that's being dedicated to one student from a board of education standpoint again i'm playing devil's advocate here and what i'm going to tell you is that kid doesn't need a, an adult sitting by them in every class to be able to access the curriculum in a way that an average kid could yeah, what, what he does is he just sits in the back and there are several kids in there mm -hmm. who are on iep so he would just listen to the material and then he's then he they go with him one period a day uh -huh. and then he's supposed to digest the material for them you know so well there's there should be an amount of hours actually listed per per week you know your child will be received five hours per week okay. of pull out instructional help if that's not happening they're violating the iep but if that's happening then they're following the iep in most counties and most jurisdictions will actually spell out the amount of hours per week of services your child's going to get under an iep program okay. because they're going to build that into the schedule so if it says we'll receive 15 hours in a special education, in a classroom with a special education teacher, well then it, most likely what's going to happen is math, reading, and language, there's going to be a second adult in that room assisting the class. And that's how they're going to deliver their 15 hours of services. So that IEP is probably going to be fairly specific about the amount of hours and how those services are going to be delivered. Because they want it measurable, that way when they get audited they can say, well, we provided this 15 hours of services in this manner. Because the more specific they make it, the easier it is to quantify the fact they did it. So, okay. so uh, again, IEPs, going to take a person, in most cases. You've got to take a person to be either sitting, you know, being a, a, another adult in the room that goes around and helps you know, kids with assignments or coaching or training on visual assistive devices. If your child doesn't need that, then you're probably looking at a 504 plan where we're going to do stuff for your kid that doesn't require a person there to do it all the time. A 504 plan is usually a series of accommodations that help students participate as a non-disabled student would. Again, we're going to change the environment so that your child can act like every other child. There's the quote from federal law. I'll let you read at your leisure. Basically, it says we're going to make it so it's just like your kid isn't disabled in the classroom. They're going to have the same ability to participate in the curriculum. What does it not provide for? Again, that, ho that horrible sentence, your child has the right to be average. I know that's not what we want to hear as parents. We want the best for our kids. The school system says you have the right to be average. So we're going to make sure that your kid can access the curriculum as close as we can get it to what other kids can do. Now, if they end up excelling, more power to them. But you have the right to be average. When does it start? At the same time an IEP does. When you have that initial meeting, when you get that letter from World's Greatest Elementary School saying, welcome to kindergarten in fall of 2011, that's when you're going to have that initial meeting. And at that meeting, or a couple of meetings later, you're going to bring your medical information. They're going to initiate educational testing. That'll take place over the beginning of your child's education. So it's quite possible, unless that testing happens over the summer before your child enters school, that your child will enter school, and then this educational testing will take happen. So that's why it's really important that when you register your kid for school, if you're registering in the spring, ask for the educational testing then, so that your child can start off with whatever series of accommodations they need in the fall. 
So they're going to do educational testing. You're going to bring medical documentation. You're going to sit as a team and you're going to decide, hey, you know what? A 504 plan is going to be good enough. We can change the environment and that'll be enough to help my kid achieve what he should be able to achieve in the curriculum. Bring medical documentation. Ask your doctor, do you think things like type size, glare, contrast, sharing materials. If your kid has a null point, sharing materials is not going to work. We found that out the hard way. If you're, you know, when your son's having to turn his chin to his shoulder to be able to see correctly, sharing a book's not going to work. So um, ask the ophthalmologist, you know, what kind of, what kind of things do you think might be an issue in school? And have them list them. Child will have, child may have difficulty with small point size, glare, um, not seated in proximity to instruction. You'll learn great phrases like that. Um, you know, will not be able to share materials due to a head tilt. Just simple things like that are going to make that 504 meeting go, go be so much more productive because you'll have an idea of what your kid's going to need. And to be honest with you, if the school system has a vision teacher. If she gets a documentation that says, you know, reading acuity is 2070, um, you know, has a null point to extreme left side, you know, uh, has a problem with glare, there's a medical term for that, like when you, when bright white sunlight bothers you, oh, my son has it, I can't remember, it's too much black in the last 11 years. Photophobia, thank you. Uh, you know, photophobia exists. A, a vision teacher's going to be able to say that and go, okay, I got a pretty good handle on what's going to help this kid. So after that initial meeting, they're going to do educational testing. You're going to bring the medical documentation. You're going to come back. You're going to make the probably going to make the decision then on is a 504 best or an IEP is best. As a parent, you're probably going to argue an IEP. As a school system, they're probably going to argue a 504. And what you really need to try and drill down is okay, what accommodations does my child need to succeed in school? And if it's things like enlarged print use of magnifiers being able to leave class early so they don't have to navigate a busy hallway, sitting up front, not sitting near a light source, not using, um, not using uh, overhead projectors, using LCD projectors instead. That sounds like an IEP, that's actually a 504 because all we've done is change the environment. Unless I need a person sitting with your child for a certain amount of hours a week to deliver a service, we probably only need a 504 and there's nothing wrong with that to be honest with you. Um, 504 plans can cover a lot of the same areas as far as providing accommodations. That whole test taking thing, my son's had a 504 all through school and his is all because they started with bubble tests in first grade, I couldn't believe it. Um, the, his IEPs or his 504 has always said he gets to write on the test and then somebody else will bubble it in. One year it ended up being his principal because he had all of his other assistants out doing the testing and he ended up being the one bubbling in Drew's test. But that's a 504 plan, that's not an IEP. So even if you're thinking of a list of 13 different accommodations, I think my son's first 504 was 17 points long. Unless it requires a person on a daily or weekly basis, it's probably a 504 plan. And like I said, that's okay. Because we're trying to create an environment where your child can learn as any other kid could. Um, there typically will not be a list of goals or follow-up testing on a 504. Here's how we're gonna change the environment. An IEP is very much goal structured. By the end of this year, your child will read at least 80% level using a magnifier. You're not going to see that on a 504. You're going to see, we'll be allowed to wear a hat outside. We'll be allowed to use a magnifier. We'll have materials enlarged 140%. You're not going to see goals and you're not going to see time periods on a 504. It's simply, here's how we're changing the environment. And typically they do not provide for extra instruction like small group coaching or learning how to use assistive technology devices because that requires people. If it requires people, it's probably going to be an IEP plan. So what kind of accommodations can you get in the 504 plan? I know I've mentioned a lot of them, but I wanted to have them written down so you guys can check, check later. Have them sit near instruction. Now that doesn't mean always the front of the room. Sitting near instruction does not always mean you're sitting right next to where the LCD projector is because if the class moves, you need to be where the instructor is. There's no front of the room in PE class. I need him by the PE teacher when he's showing this is how we're going to throw a softball today or whatever, or kick a kickball or whatever they do. Um, and again, if they're doing circle time, probably needs to be right next to the teacher so the teacher can, you know, hand in the material down and let them see the page real quick instead of them doing that quick little, you know, scan around the room they do. Um, have materials enlarged to a degree that works best for a student. With nystagmus, bigger isn't always better. Enlarging things don't, doesn't always solve the problem. Again, it's going to be specific to your kid. In some cases, the problem isn't the point size, it's how close together the letters are. 
you space out the letters a little bit more, all of a sudden they don't have visual crowding in the middle of the word. My son has that, where he can read regular print just fine, but if it's a long word, seven or nine letters, the middle ones kind of get jammed up. So he uses a lot of context clues to figure out what words are, because he knows the beginning and the end, and he knows, hey, that's supposed to be a verb, and so he can guess really well. But making that text bigger isn't really going to solve that problem. So enlarged text is not a be-all, end-all solution for visual problems, especially in the stagnus. In a lot of cases, contrast is going to be a lot more important than point size. I've got black type on a white background here. Um, if you've got teachers that use light blue type on dark blue backgrounds because it's pretty, um, yeah, that you know that may work for the, the third grade girls in the room, but your girl who has an astagmus is probably not going to like it. Um, high contrast, high contrast materials, and that's a very easily done accommodation. It's one that's rather common in Vision 504s. Um, each child is different. It's really going to come down to the checklist for your kid. The first time we wrote a 504, and we had to talk about sunblock. Our, um, they brought in a special ed teacher who was not a vision teacher, and she didn't like me very much by the end of that meeting. But uh, she couldn't believe that we were bothering with something like sunscreen. I'm like, yeah, my kid's got albinism. You know, do, do, do you seen him? Can we roll up his sleeve? We'll show you how pale he is. Um, yeah, we're going to worry about sunscreen, guys, and we're going to let him wear a hat. And she was like, I can't believe we're wasting time on this. Well, yeah, we're going to, because I want him to be able to see when he walks back inside from half an hour out of recess. So that was specific to my kid. Not everybody's all, all or not everybody's nystagmus is albinism linked. For my son, it was, and his albinism was almost a bigger deal than his nystagmus was, because that kid burns in like five minutes. Um, so you got to find out what works for your kid, and that's where a vision teacher going into the classroom and observing early in the school year is going to be a vital resource. If your Kelly has a vision teacher, demand it. I want to have an observation done within the first month so that we can do an assessment on whether we're providing the kind of things my child needs or not. And if they don't have a vision teacher, ask them why not. Yes, question. Did you have a right to have it like on the 504 plan that the child read a copy of everything that's Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yep. Mm -hmm. um, if they use overheads, when my son was at elementary school, his elementary school was old, didn't have LCD projectors, we put on his 504 plan, we'll receive a copy of everything written on an overhead. All, yeah, his teachers got LCD projectors. Because <laughs> they didn't want to have to rewrite every overhead. They're like, i got to rewrite every overhead page? I'm like, if you're going to use an overhead, you do. Because you can't see it. Um, and to be honest with you, especially in schools that use LCD projectors with PowerPoints, Every year I have, because I, I teach special ed supported classes where I have another teacher and I've got eight kids with IEPs in the room. Three, four of them in every one of those classes will need copies and notes for reading comprehension problems. And to be honest with you, as a teacher, you tell me it needs written copies and notes, that's an easy one. I print off my PowerPoint, you know, two slides a page, I get it sent to the copy shop, get it sent back, and hand it to the kid. Or I just print it in my printer in my room, or I send it to the you know, the faculty printer down. The, 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 yeah, copies and notes is an easy one. I mean, because you will not be the first kid that's ever asked for that. I can guarantee you that. Because you're going to see that a lot with reading comprehension IEPs, where they're going to do copies and notes. Because you'll have a lot of kids that there's a specific re there's a specific reading comprehension problem where kids will see things and then literally cannot write them down. There's a transference problem somewhere. somewhere. And you'll see that a lot more often. You'll see vision problems with copies and notes. Copies and notes is no big deal at all. I wouldn't hesitate to ask for that at all because they're already doing it for another kid. I'll guarantee it. We had that with what you just said with her homework. Yeah. They have like a, a assignment book. Yeah. They have an assignment book page on the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of her teachers was giving me a hard time. She never copied down her assignments. Well, they get three minutes at the end of class while they're packing up the backpack to copy this. Yeah, she makes it. And I said, <laughs> You know, she's had it written down for her. And, you know, if it work, if it being on the whiteboard's not working for her, then yeah, it's for that accommodation. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've Yeah. And in a lot of cases, it's finding out what works for your kid. And a great time to review that is that first midterm check, first semester, first marking period. That That's, that's a great time to have that parent conference say, okay, what are you seeing? Because we're only four weeks in or five weeks in. But that's long enough as a teacher for me to figure out what's going on. Something I should wrap it up. <laughs> All right, what else? Display of text. There's alternate methods. Whiteboard easels. My son's teachers all of them ended up with one of these because um, he couldn't see an overhead projector. His middle school loves him because he had, they all have to get whiteboards now. 
So. Bill, if I'm showing up, that means Graham Reaper has one. That's okay. Um, Oh, uh, we can be fairly close. So the rest of the accommodations, um, as far as, I'll, I'll jump to the end just to mention it, you guys can read it. After school, like I said, IEPs and 504s don't, but colleges get real picky on what they're going to allow you to do. They're not going to provide anything. They'll let you do stuff. So, you know, as far as extended time, you might need to talk to a professor about that and say, look, I have a 504 plan. The 504 plan itself is not going to be enough for most colleges. You're going to have to send, you're going to have to basically reapply, and send you know for for accommodations and send them medical documentation along with your 504 plan. And I mentioned that at the end of the presentation. Um, I guess I'll finish up with a, a couple of slides from my son's 504. Um, to be seated, not facing a light source. That's a big deal for him. If you if there's a light shining in his direction, he can't see anything that's written down in front of him on a whiteboard or a God forbid a chalkboard or a overhead. He just can't see it. Um, window blinds should not be completely open. Again, way too, the whole photophobia thing. Just bright light just throws him off completely. Um, and we put in on the phrase Andrew Rooley Quest as needed a lot because he's in sixth grade now and we're trying to encourage him to do self advocacy. So it's like I'm telling him, hey, you need to tell people what works for you because you're the only one that knows what works for you. So you need to, you need to tell the teacher. Now, obviously, they're going to get a copy of this, and most of them are going to comply immediately. But, you know, in case they forgot, can you close the blinds, please? I can't see. Uh, close to instructional activity, allow them to wear hats, sunglasses, and sunscreen on recess. Of course, we don't need that now. It's in middle school, but it was definitely needed before. I put it over. Can I ask a question yes. about um, when the IEPs are done yes. and the school year starts, mm -hmm. how are the teachers notified that that I'll tell you what should happen, and I'll tell you what I do. What should happen is they are provided a list by the special education department before instruction starts. I can tell you what does happen. I get that list about the middle of September. If I want my kids' teachers to know what my kids' 504 IEP plan is, I go to that back to school night, or I schedule a meeting during that couple of days of meetings they have before they start school, and I personally hand it to them. Okay. And, and I work in the system, and I can't guarantee that my kids' 504 is going to be on their desk before the first day of school. So I just make sure I take it to them. Yeah, that too. Absolutely. Yes? You know, if we actually have it written into his 504 plan that mm -hmm. the day before school starts when the teachers are setting up the classrooms, yeah. he gets to go in and walk through all of the classrooms to kind of see what's on all the walls. Our, our county is really good about having an open, open house usually the Thursday before school starts so that they can walk through and they'll actually have their desks already assigned. And he can kind of take it in. And um, since he's going into sixth grade, he gets to do an orientation on Wednesday. We're going to take him Wednesday at 1 o'clock, where he'll get a tour of the building and show him, hey, this is where your math class is going to be. This is where your science classes are going to be. So, um, but yeah, ask for it. They don't supply it, ask for it. Hey, I love my kid. Can we set up a very quick tour of the building? My son's got visual issues. It'd be, he'd feel a lot better if he knew the layout of the building before he showed up the first day. I can't imagine you'd get any resistance to that request. And teachers know, oh, here's the child with a vision problem. Absolutely. And I've got to tell you, the first two teachers I go to at back to school night is math and phys ed. Because the math teacher is going to be the one with the little tiny symbols, and the phys ed teacher is going to be the one who tries to throw a frisbee to them. So <laughs> I can see math and phys ed. Those are the two. Um, own book, no sharing. I highly recommend that one. Light gathering magnifier. Our county actually provided one. Um, Small, it was 10 bucks. I mean, I've seen them at craft stores, they're not that expensive, but it really helped. Um, screen large and computer program, um, there's various ones. I think I forgot the name of the one we use, but there has to be a computer in his school that has Zoom text, that's the one he uses, that has it available. So when his teacher assigns any kind of computer assignment, he can enlarge the screen. And the other thing we did was allowed to use a full-size laptop. Schools love these little netbooks now. These things are about that big, and they cost about 250 bucks. Cheap as anything. You can get on the internet with them. As a teacher, I love them, because they're tiny, they're easy to secure, they're not big, bulky laptops. Sucks for my son, he can't read a thing on them. So we had this 504 plan. If you're gonna do a computer lab in the room, yeah, he gets a full-size laptop, because he can't read a netbook. So. Oh, and the infamous bubble sheets. Um, to be honest with you, just writing on the test or writing on the answer booklet is usually enough and then letting somebody else go and fill in those god-awful bubbles. Because I know the whole visual crowding thing, he can't tell between the rows. When you give him that sheet of like 50 bubbles, with five on each row and 50 rows, he's lost. 
So he answers in the answer book and somebody else fills in the bubbles. And it's as simple as that. Boom, done. Um, and I guess I'll wrap up with, if you have a disagreement, 99 out of 100 disagreements can be solved within the IEP meeting. Um, and remember, you're, you're, only, you're only legally allowed what's average, not what's best. And if there's a dispute, there is a resolution process that is set up that typically requires you going through the Board of Education first. I would highly suggest avoiding litigation if at all possible. I've heard some horror stories that it could be resolved with anything but lawsuits, but 99 times out of 100, you guys in the school system are going to be able to find common ground. And it's going to require some vigilance as a parent. It's, you know, because teachers forget, I've got 115 kids. And crap, I forgot to enlarge the worksheet that day. I swear to you, I'll get it to them tomorrow. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> um, and I mean, I've done it as a teacher. I had a kid who was wheelchair bound. And we planned a field trip. And do you think me or the other teacher was going on the field trip remembered to get a bus that was wheelchair accessible? No, we forgot. Mom called the week before. Hey, Bill, you did remember to get one of the lift, right? Oh crap, let me take care of that. Thanks, no problem. She hangs up, she knows it's been hunt called, I get my vice principal to call the bus company, we got one with a wheelchair left. It's gonna be the same thing for you guys. Hey, I know you guys have state testing coming up on March, it's February 1st, did you order the enlarged textbooks that my son needs? Yeah, yeah we did, got it right here on the list. Or, oh, I guess I better do that now, instead of showing up the day of the test and all of a sudden there's you know 10 point type of a bubble sheet. So some gentle, friendly reminders of what services your child needs goes a long way. It really, I mean, it's speaking from a teacher end of things. And we're not perfect. There's gonna be a day we forget to enlarge that worksheet, or my LCD projector breaks and I just gotta go get an overhead from the media center because that's the only thing I've got. So, you know, just gentle reminders when needed go a long way. And I guess, I guess I'm done. I'm sorry I didn't quite get through everything. I think I'm a little ambitious on how many slides I could get through. Any questions you have, my contact information is on the back. It's uh, dunkmediaservices at gmail.com. I'm a political speech writer as a hobby, so. I just want to remind everybody that the youth panel starts right after this session, and um, it's in the Commonwealth room, which is where we had lunch. So, any questions? I'll be hanging around for a little bit. I gotta drive back to Salisbury tonight, which is about, if you know east, the East Coast, it's about three hours away, so. But I live like a half an hour from the ocean, so it all works out. Um, but yeah, anything, you've, like, I can speak from a teacher who sat on these meetings, and I can sit as a parent of, on an 11-year-old who's been using a 504 for six years now. So, enjoy the panel. Yes? Are teachers uh, generally supposed to adjust the greeting? Like, if the child's trying, the yeah. ability to do well, but you know they're failing or getting B's. Um, like some teachers do, they'll give them, they'll give her like you know B's and C's because she's really trying hard. Because I, you know, with another class. As a high school student, no. Mm -mm. I'll accommodate the curriculum as I need to. I'll enlarge anything I need enlarged. I'll offer you tutoring as I would any other student. I'll enlarge the test. I'll make sure I don't offer scantrons. I'll put you in the front of the room. I'll give you copies of notes if it's in your 504 plan. But if you're failing my test, you're failing my test. Now, we probably need to find out why you're failing my test. There may be an educational reason. There may be something completely unrelated to school. But am I going to accommodate my grade simply because of your vision difficulty? No, mm -mm. not going to do it. But what I am going to do is start digging and finding out why you're not doing so great. You know, why are you failing my class? And maybe it's study habits. Maybe it's reading comprehension. Maybe there's an undiagnosed reading disability that has you know, been complicated by the vision difficulty. So, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I need to talk to the special ed department. We need to do some more educational testing and find out, okay, is there something specific going on that we can address that we're not already addressing? But am I going to accommodate a grade just because the kid's trying hard and can't see that grade? No. Mm -hmm. As brutal as that sounds, no. No, you're not. Because like I told my son, that big bad world doesn't care what you can see. <laughs>